Eddie and Linda. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, appreciate the invitation to uh, be with you this morning and speak. Uh, <clears throat> as was mentioned, I was recently elected conference president for Iowa, Missouri. I don't officially start until July 1st, but there is a process between Dean and I of, of slowly handing things off. And uh, I would just encourage your prayers for our conference office. Amen. Uh, there's been a lot of transition. Um, people retiring, people taking positions elsewhere. Uh, if you looked at the Treasury Department a year ago versus now, uh, everybody's new. <laughs> and so as president, obviously, I'm uh, the face of the conference, viewed as the spiritual leader of the conference. But I think Treasury probably carries the greatest burden. And we were so blessed to have Rhonda Carr uh, in our Treasury Department, I think, for well over 50 years. And uh, our new treasurer is, is doing a great job, but she definitely needs our prayers. Uh, the person that cares for us financially uh, makes financial decisions in the best interest of the conference. So just please keep all of us in your prayers as we go through transition. I'm gonna, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. As part of my devotional life, I like to spend uh, an entire month in a book of the Bible. So in October, I spent the entire month in First, or in first Corinthians. In uh, November, I was in Second Corinthians. And as I spent time studying those books, I was listening to a sermon by a pastor on First Corinthians. And one of the things that he said is that people uh, that are looking forward to the second coming of Christ should become familiar with first and second Corinthians. I agree with him. There's a lot of important theology there. Uh, there's also a lot of important circumstances that we should study that will prepare us for the soon return of Jesus Christ. And so I, we can't spend all day or, or one hour in the entire book of first Corinthians, but we are going to look at chapter one. Let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we are seeing the signs around us. We are seeing prophecy fulfilled, good being called evil, evil being called good. Which leads us to believe, although we don't know the day or hour, that Jesus is coming soon. But that transition for God's people will not be an easy one. Now more than ever, we must focus on our faith and we must look to Jesus for hope and strength in a world that is falling apart. And I pray as we study this morning that we can leave here with a sense of hope in Jesus' name. Amen. It was April 19, 1993, and I was miserable. I was laying on my parents' couch in their farmhouse, uh, and I was on about day three of the flu, probably COVID before we knew what COVID was. And... Uh, fever off and on, and I was laying there, and I decided about two o'clock in the afternoon to flip the TV on. We only had about three channels, and every channel had one event, and that was uh, two tanks that the FBI had sent into the Waco, Texas compound, and a fire erupts. Now, it was 51 days earlier that the ATF, a different government agency uh, tried to go in and it started a four-hour gunfight which three ATF agents lost their life. Ultimately, the FBI would take over and for 51 days they would try to negotiate and ultimately, uh, if you saw that on the news that day, two tanks go in, a fire starts, and I think all but three people in that compound died. Now, there's been all kinds of discussions since then. Uh, every once in a while you'll see something in the news uh, over whose fault that fire was, whether the government handled the situation correctly. Regardless of whether it was handled correctly or not, those, I think, 71 people that died, died because they put their faith in a man. They believed everything he said and never tested his belief system or his authority. And as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus, I believe it's important for us to filter everything we hear through Scripture. Because the devil is doing everything that he can to deceive. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians is dealing with a church that had slid from its original path. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. First Corinthians chapter one. Verse 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Through the will of God, and so Thenes, our brother, verse 2, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Apostle Paul that was the one that planted the church in Corinth. Uh, as he was moving from place to place, being led by the Holy Spirit, God called Paul to the city of Corinth to start a Christian church where there was no church. And what do we know about the city of Corinth? Well, if you look at a map, the city of Corinth uh, it was located on a small strip of land separating the southwest part of what we would call modern-day Greece and the northeast part of modern-day Greece. And so a, a city probably about three and a half miles wide. What do we know about the city? Well, it was a major trade route uh, going from one part of the country to the other, but it was also a major place for shipping because either ships would have to sail around Greece, which created more distance and it was dangerous to do and so what they decided to do is one of two things uh, what they would do with large ships is they would unload the goods on the east or west side transport it through the city put it on a ship going the opposite direction uh, they were sophisticated enough that if the ship was small enough they devised a system of rollers to roll the ship through the city that would have been a sight to see uh, from one port to the other it was also a city with different philosophies, religions. But the biggest thing the city was known for, it was known as the city of sin. Anything that could happen did happen in the city of Corinth. And so God sends the Apostle Paul into that city, a city known of, of every evil known to man, in order to share the gospel with those people. Sometimes in the world that we live in, we think it's never been worse than it is today. I don't think that's true. History just repeats itself. The difference is they didn't have social media and internet back then. But the city was corrupt beyond imagine. And so the Apostle Paul goes in, he preaches the gospel, a church is raised up, people give their hearts and minds to Jesus Christ but as we'll read in just a little bit, that church that started out with such a positive faith ultimately ran into trouble. Verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So as Paul is writing this letter, he's thankful for the grace of God, the grace of God that loved a, a corrupt city so much that he would send one of his workers in to give those individuals an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. But he's also thankful that as a church was raised, he says in verse 5, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So as a church was raised up, as it grew in faith, as it grew in numbers, God gave them all wisdom and knowledge to help the work go forward. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. What does that mean? We know from Revelation that when we see the phrase testimony of Jesus, it is referring to the prof prophetic gift. And the prophetic gift is one of the end time markers of God's end time church. So God gave the church in Corinth the prophetic gift for the purpose of helping the church grow and move forward. Verse 7. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So just as Christ came in through the Apostle Paul, through the work of others to raise up a church, that God would confirm them, that he would keep them strong until the revelation of Jesus, meaning the second coming. There are two major themes that we see in the writings of Paul throughout the letters of the New Testament. Salvation by grace in Jesus Christ and the second coming of Jesus. Paul believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus would come in his lifetime. 
And so he preached with that mindset because he wanted people to continue to focus on Christ and he wanted people to keep their eyes on the soon return. But in verse 10, we start to get into some of the issues that were forming cracks in the church in Corinth. Verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Later in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says that there were other church members besides Chloe's household that wrote to Paul expressing that there were major issues going on within the church in Corinth. And so he writes to plead to them that they, they walk in faith, that they walk in unity, that they speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among them. But then he gets to the heart of the matter in verse 11. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Apollo, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Paul gets to the heart of what ultimately was starting to cause the divisions in this church in Corinth. People were giving allegiance to individuals. So there's a group within the church that says, well, we're of Paul, Paul being the one that God called to the city to preach the gospel originally in that city. Paul was the one that raised up a church. And so there were members within the church that were saying, this is the person that we're giving our allegiance to. Others said, I am of Apollos. And we don't know much about Apollos other than in Acts chapter uh, 12, uh, we're given a description of Apollos in a couple areas. It describes Apollos as a man that had great wisdom in the scriptures and that God had not only given him great wisdom in the scriptures, but God had given him the ability to articulate those scriptures to people in a way that they could understand. And so most likely Paul, Apollos was the one that followed, uh, the work, uh, followed up the work in Corinth after Paul left. And, and so there's individuals in the church that they are giving their allegiance to Apollos. Others said, I'm of Cephas, meaning Peter. Peter being one of the original 12 disciples. There were individuals that saying, well, he's the one that we should look to because he was originally with Jesus. Then there was the fourth group, I am of Christ, which we would think, well, that's the group we would want to be a part of, except for the fact that he is, this group is named as one of the four divisions. Most likely, they were the spiritual snobs in the church. We have four factions and they're divided over who their leader is going to be. And Paul asked the rhetorical question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I baptized the, whole, the household of Stephanas. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. He asks an important question. Is Christ divided? Paul is seeking to turn their attention from looking to humanity as their leader and getting their attention back to Jesus Christ. In, in the church today, oftentimes we think our greatest danger as a denomination is something that is going to come from the outside. I think we're missing the boat. The devil is seeking to introduce just a little bit of error it can be 1% error versus 99% truth to steer us in the wrong direction. A simple thing in the church of Corinth, a simple thing of who the human leader is, and we're going to argue over that when Christ is the head of the church. And we're just as susceptible today as they were back then. About a year ago, I was a asked by a church board to come and help them deal with an issue that they were facing. 
And as we got in, had prayer and got into the meeting, the issue was there was a group within the church that got, that got caught up in something that I believe the devil is trying to introduce, the idea that the Holy Spirit is not its own entity. That the Holy Spirit is simply this mystical force that comes out of God the Father, Jesus the Son. Now, to back this up, they had YouTube videos they wanted me to watch. They had a stack of papers they wanted me to read. And I just started asking them questions. I said, well, can you show me scriptures from the Bible that are contrary, sorry about this, that are contrary to what our church believes relating to the Holy Spirit? And they couldn't do that. They just continued to refer me back to these uh, papers and back to these videos. So then I started pointing out scriptures. And I started pointing out different scriptures that point to the fact that the Holy Spirit is its own entity. And even though we don't see the word Trinity in the Bible, there is a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three co-eternals. Ultimately, 15 people would have their names removed from the church on their own accord. All because one of them started watching videos on YouTube. The devil is seeking to introduce error. And we are susceptible to identifying with people instead of looking to Jesus. And that is what exactly what happened in the church in Corinth. They started off so well. They started off through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God working great things through their church. And the devil just wanted to introduce just a little bit of a discussion of who is ultimately the greatest leader that has ever been in this church. And before he knew it, they were into all kinds of evil practices. And he seeks in verse 18 to now start to bring them back. Verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger. There were two groups that the Apostle Paul was seeking to reach, and there were two groups that God was seeking to reach. That was the Jews and the Gentiles. And both of them had major struggles when it came to accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Gentiles thought the gospel was foolishness because it was counter to their belief system. The Greeks believed that human wisdom could solve the world's problems. That if men and and women just came together and reasoned together, that they could solve the world problems. I think we figured out that that doesn't work. You cannot solve human problems through human wisdom and reasoning. It was also contrary to their belief system because they could not wrap their minds around the idea that people would worship a God that came down, that took the most uh, cruel Roman punishment at that time known to man. Their gods just wouldn't do that. The Jews, he writes in verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. Why was the gospel a stumbling block to the Jews? It was a stumbling block because Jesus did not fit the description of the Messiah that they were looking for. They were looking for a conquering king. They were looking for a king that would come and deliver the nation of Israel from the authority of the Romans and that he would make the nation of Israel the supreme uh, entity on earth. Christ had no intention of doing that. His intention was to bring heavenly principles to the earth. Christ's life of service and sacrifice was counterintuitive to their human hearts. And you know what? It's counterintuitive to ours as well. The gospel calls us, Jesus calls us to love our enemies, pray for those that persecute us. 
the gospel calls us in Philippians chapter 2 to look out for the interests of others before our own. And so the gospel of Christ is counterintuitive to our own fallen human nature. But yet Paul writes, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. You know, I can't explain everything there is about the Holy Spirit. There are questions I have about the Holy Spirit as future president. We're not given everything. There are questions I have about the nature of Christ that we don't fully know. And we're told we're going to study those things through eternity. I can't honestly explain how the gospel works other than I have seen it transform my heart and I have seen it transform others. I remember, uh, this was even before I was a pastor, I was working in the aviation industry and and I was asked, uh, there was a couple that worked at the same company, they were in different departments, the husband was in my department. And uh, they were having some marital issues, and God just impressed me to ask them if they wanted to study the Bible. Now, I had never given a Bible study in my life. And so I went to their home, and in my own feeble abilities, uh, we would have a Bible study every week. And about four weeks in, before I had opening prayer, uh, the husband said, we need to talk to you about something, okay? And my first thought is, they're about to tell me, you're lousy at this, we want somebody else. And they said, because of the studies that you have done, we both made the decision this week to accept Jesus Christ into our lives. I was floored. (laughs) Because I looked at how I was tripping through scriptures, I was nervous, and somehow the power of God worked through that to change their hearts. I can't explain how the gospel works. But the reason I believe what Paul says for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God because the power of God truly works. That when people open up their hearts and their minds to Jesus Christ, even though we can't fully explain what is going on and what is happening, we can see the evidence and that is what people can't argue with. The apostle Paul believed heavily in the power of God. And one of the greatest books that was ever written in the area of evangelism, a book that we all ought to read, Evangelism, page 272. I'm going to read a quote from that. There's many quotes, but I want to read this quote to you. Evangelism, page 272. There are many who try to correct the life of others by attacking what they consider are wrong habits. They go to those whom they think are in error and they point out their defects. They say, you don't dress as you should. They try to pick off the ornaments or whatever seems offensive, but they do not seek to fasten the mind to the truth. Those who seek to correct others should present the attractions of Jesus. They should talk of his love, his compassion, present his example and sacrifice, reveal his spirit. She goes on to say, there is something richer to speak of. Talk of Christ, and when the heart is converted, everything that is out of harmony with the word of God will drop off. See, what Paul is seeking to help them understand, what he's seeking to get us to understand, is he was looking for the believers in Corinth to have an internal religion. And the internal religion would affect the external And I think at times we as a church have struggled with that concept. See, the question that we have to ask ourselves, boy, this thing is just going to give me trouble. The question that we have to ask ourselves is do we truly believe in the gospel? Do we truly believe that the gospel is powerful enough to change human hearts? And do we trust and believe that God can work in his own timing? I had a privilege of uh, attending the Iowa prayer breakfast. And I know sometimes religion and politics 
gets a little bit messy. And I know because of our, world, our biblical view on how governments will uh, persecute God's people at the end of time, we tend to get a little bit nervous about religion and politics, and that's fair. But it was nice to be at a prayer breakfast in Iowa where uh, some of our politicians were openly proclaiming their faith in Jesus. And one of the things the guest speaker said is we have to be careful that we are cooking people, not burning them. And they use the example, if you throw a frog in hot water, what's that frog going to do? Try to jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water and slowly boil it, it won't do anything, right? It'll get, because it's becoming a custom. The spiritual side of that is as we work with people, we should work as slow cookers, that we are bringing them along and we are allowing the power of God to transform their hearts and minds. When Evangelism, page 272, references the truth, and when the Apostle Paul references the truth, they are referencing the truth in the context of the gospel has the power to completely transform hearts and minds. The question we have to ask ourselves is are we in line with the Holy Spirit when it comes to working with people? When it comes to transforming people's lives? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The Apostle Paul had to face major issues in the church in Corinth. Church members were suing each other. <clears throat> there was major immorality going on inside the church that had to be addressed. And the Apostle Paul didn't shy away from dealing with those issues. But he did that on the basis of starting with the principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its ability to transform hearts and minds. We are called to stand and be faithful in a world that is becoming more and more corrupt. We are called to fight against our own inclination of walling ourselves off. When we look in the scriptures that Jesus walked and lived among corruption and sin. Do we, as a people, believe that the gospel has the power to transform the most corrupt people in this world. Heavenly Father, forgive us. Sometimes we have an attitude of this world that we live in and how harsh it is. Things could never be worse than they are now. When we look at Scripture and disciple after disciple and prophet after prophet, you call to enter some of the most corrupt sinful civilizations that existed. And when those prophets and disciples kept their eyes focused on Jesus, they completely transformed the culture around them. Lord, help us to move from victim mentality to fighter mentality. Help us to keep our eyes so focused on you that the light of the truth shines forth, that it holds us steadfast and strong, and that we have the privilege of seeing the gospel transform even the hardest hearts in our local community. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm not sure what our closing hymn is. 152?